A strange turn of events had sparked that epiphany on Miami Beach. It began with a Philadelphia area grocery chain executive in the 1940s who'd simply had enough. Running his operation was a nightmare. And the problem was industry-wide. You had people manually putting price stickers on products. You had people manually then hand keying those prices into a cash register and really spending time with every single product that a shopper was taking through the checkout. That's Carrie Wilkie from GS1 US, the organization that coordinates and standardizes barcodes in the United States. There was a lot of inefficiency and a lot of time spent for the consumers in the grocery store, really in the checkout lane, waiting to pay and exit the store. So this supermarket executive visited a dean at Drexel and begged him to help engineer a solution to all his store's inefficiencies. The Drexel dean brushed the executive off, but one of the postgrads overheard the conversation and found it pretty interesting. The postgrad, Bob Silver, mentioned the conversation to one of his friends. That friend was Joseph Woodland. And together, the two thought maybe they could invent something to help the supermarket executive. This random game of telephone is what got Woodland to move down to Florida and start drawing dots and dashes in the sand on Miami Beach. But you probably wouldn't recognize what he ended up with. The first early incarnation of a barcode was actually in a bullseye shape. Woodland had enough foresight to realize that when store checkers would swipe items over the sensor, they would probably do so in all sorts of different orientations. Even if every label was fixed perfectly to, let's say, a can of soup, it might be upside down, horizontal, or vertical when the checker tried to swipe it. This created a problem because he was going to base his code design off of Morse code. And like the letters in a word, a Morse code style design wouldn't be able to read from any angle. So Woodland solved this problem by expanding the dots and dashes into circular lines, which would make it omnidirectional. Or in other words, essentially copy that Morse-inspired code into an infinite number of orientations for the sensor. Looking down at his sketch and reveling in the prospect that he may have just invented something big, Woodland relayed the idea back to Bob Silver. Silver loved the idea, so much that the two got to work sketching out the mechanical schematics, finalizing their code design, and filing for a patent later that same year. Then they began constructing a prototype, but soon realized the system wasn't quite working. The problem, this was all pretty advanced stuff. Theoretically, it made sense, but the actual available components hadn't caught up to the theory. It'd basically be like trying to build an iPhone with consumer computer parts from the 1980s. It just wasn't going to happen. Specifically, Woodland and Silver struggled with the light sensor. They couldn't find a bright enough light for the sensor to clearly interpret the code. They also lacked access to any modern computing technology to log the information that came out of the scanner. Woodland, hoping to get the help he needed to make the system work, soon took a job at IBM. But even that computing and electronics juggernaut couldn't provide the tech to get it off the ground. So Woodland shelved the idea. Almost two decades would pass before it saw the light of day again. By the late 1960s, it became clear that the grocery executive pleading with the Drexel Dean years earlier was not alone. So the grocery industry got together to start talking about ways to harness technology to fix the inefficiencies in their stores. They really needed something that was an intra-industry identifier that would uniquely say what was a can of beans versus a box of cereal so that they could move product more efficiently and move product more quickly and cut down costs and really cut down wait times for the consumers who were standing in line at grocery stores. The chain Kroger helped kick off the industry's efforts in 1966, when it released a pamphlet soliciting help developing a scanning system from electronics companies. Their search led them to the Radio Corporation of America, or RCA. RCA, the most trusted name in electronics. RCA was an enormous electronics firm with a reputation that would rival Google or Amazon today. 
And just like these present-day tech giants, RCA was hungry to break into new markets. A dedicated group of RCA engineers and researchers took on the challenge. Soon, they found Woodland and Silver's patent, and RCA's team realized that with new advances in technology, they could make it work. Two advances in particular changed the game. The first was the microchip. Invented in 1958, it set the groundwork for advanced compact computing that could read, log, and interpret data from the scanner. The second was the laser. Invented in 1960, focused light and lasers would finally offer enough brightness for an electronic sensor to clearly and consistently read a printed code on a label. By 1972, RCA's team had created a working bullseye barcode system, ready for Kroger to test out in a real store. But Kroger worried customers might reject it. Lasers were mainly associated with advanced military applications. Kroger wondered if customers might fear a death ray, as it was popularly referred to in their supermarket aisle. Kroger also worried customers might not trust computers, which were still new, to read and tally prices correctly. Hoping for the best, Kroger went ahead with rolling out their new checkout system on July 3rd, 1972 in one of their Cincinnati stores. It was a success. The system worked. It scanned codes, it tallied checkouts, and sales at the Cincinnati store went up, suggesting customers actually liked it. A group of high-ranking industry representatives soon toured the store. Seeing the technology work, along with an increasingly urgent need to control costs as the industry's already slim profit margins dip below 1%, renewed the industry leader's commitment to scaling up the barcode. But while the bullseye code prototype worked in Kroger's one store, getting everyone in the industry on the same page was tough. It took months of negotiating and glad handing. But after dozens of meetings and calls, the biggest players in both industries finally got behind the broad vision of putting a small label on every package. They would call it the Universal Product Code, or UPC. The one last thing to do was settle on the design of the standardized symbol itself. The code would need to be small and neat, a maximum of 1.5 square inches. It would need to be printable with existing technology, readable from any direction, and readable at speed, meaning from a swift swipe or scan. The grocery industry then accepted pitches based on these criteria from large electronics firms. Looking at the proposals that came in, everybody thought that the RCA bullseye was going to be the symbol that was selected. But then, one engineer at IBM flipped the script. That engineer was George Lohrer. Lohrer doubted Woodland's circular design could work at industry scale. The whole reason the code originally had a bullseye shape was to ensure it could be scanned from any angle, 